I love the privilege that God's granted to me to share His holy, His precious Word with you each week. I love topical preaching, which might be talking about different issues that we experience in life from loneliness to anger to fear to uh, bitterness. But I also love expository preaching because expository preaching is simply going verse by verse through the Scriptures, and it forces you to speak specifically to the subject written about in a given chapter uh, or a book of the Bible. So when you're doing expository verse by verse, which we're going to do in 1 Thessalonians, you can't, if you're speaking, tap dance around something that makes the speaker or the audience a little uncomfortable. Because if you want to be true to the Scriptures and true to the God of the Scriptures, you have to address the passage as it is written. No one can say, Pastor, you're on a witch hunt. You're on this personal crusade or this personal vendetta. Here's the fact. Trust me. People, last week uh, we had a soup night. It was great. And some were going, when you speak, I feel like you're speaking right to me. Like somebody called you and said, would you please speak and preach to my husband about this or to my wife about this? That's how the Word of God works. Trust me, I don't get up and go, uh, I'm gearing this toward this one specific person in the church because I realize this. That person may not even be at the service, so then what do I do? Just go, well, John didn't show up, so everybody's dismissed because I was just going to speak to John. No, it's the Word of God, and if it speaks to you, uh, make application, follow it. Last September and October, for my own personal devotions, I read through First and Second Thessalonians written by the Apostle Paul. This morning, we're starting a series on 1 Thessalonians. Rick read for us how Paul founded the church in Thessalonica, and I'm excited because I believe that you're going to find this book to be extremely relevant to us living in 21st century America, to us as individuals, and to us as a body of believers. Now, certainly a common misconception that people have outside of the church is this, that the people inside the church have no problems. They're exempt from any real personal struggles in life. And I think they look and sometimes go, I get that notion. I get that vibe because we who attend church, we put on a smile, we put on a mask, and we communicate by our countenance that everything in our world is perfect when nothing could be further from the truth. And so our mantra perhaps could be barred from the line of the old dry uh, idea deodorant commercial, which says, when in church, never let those in the pew around you see you sweat. Don't let them know that you have any problems, that you have any heartache. The fact is, those on the inside, you sitting here today, you could testify, you know from personal experience that Christians are just like everyone else. Christians are real people who live in the same world as the rest of mankind and experience many of the very same struggles. So what's the difference? What differentiates the believer in Jesus Christ from the unbeliever? The difference is a personal and life-changing encounter with the one true God through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. From the very moment that you put your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, the entire course of your life is both radically and forever changed. The gospel, which we've said all along, literally means the good news of Jesus Christ goes beyond just reforming your character or protecting you from life's challenges. The gospel should result in the transformation, the change of your heart, the change in the inner you, the real you. And one of the best proofs of your salvation is the changes that God brings about that He produces in your life since your profession of faith. And I want to give you one example of how the gospel changed the city. If you're in the book of Acts, if you just turn back to Acts 17, or I'm sorry, Acts 19, and I want to read for you verses 17 to 20, how the gospel changed the people who lived in the city of Ephesus. We read this in uh, Acts 19, beginning with verse 17. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. And many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. And when they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. Just trust me, that's a lot of money even in those days. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. 
Paul was in the city of Ephesus with his missionary companions proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. And verse 18 tells us that many believed in Jesus. They put their faith in Jesus. And how do we know that they actually became followers of Jesus? Because if you look at verse 19, many of the people in Ephesus, prior to their salvation, were engaged in practicing sorcery or black magic. But the writer Luke tells us those who profess faith in Christ for salvation, when they were saved, brought their scrolls used in sorcery and they burned them. Reading on, we discover that the silversmith of Ephesus, a man by the name of Demetrius, who made a living creating silver shrines that were used to worship the false god Artemis. Because the gospel was leading people away from idolatry, the gospel was changing lives. Demetrius, the silversmith, was losing income. The fact is, the gospel impacted the economy. Lives were genuinely and undeniably changed. Listen, what do you think would happen if we in America as Christians got serious about the good news of Jesus Christ and we got sold out to Jesus? It would impact our economy because Christians wouldn't be participating in some of the things we ought not to be participating in. But we do. It would change movies. It would change the porn industry. It would change a lot of other things in the economy. And if ever a city needed transformation, it was the city of Thessalonica. It was a real city. It wasn't make-believe. Full of real people who were overwhelmed with real struggles. Those residents there were in desperate need of a personal, life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. At the time of Paul, Thessalonica consisted of Roman citizens, Greeks, and Jews, and it numbered some 200,000 in population. This port city served as a temporary home for countless sailors and merchants and travelers and immigrants. And the city also had an impressive road system which welcomed people from both nearby and far away. Because it had a, strain, uh, a strong economy and it served as a strategic harbor and it was situated well along the uh, Roman uh, highway of, called the Ignatian Road, Thessalonica was one of the most influential cities in the first century AD. We might say that it was the equivalent of America's New York City or Los Angeles. Yet, for all of its assets, it was a mostly lost city. The Greeks went to their temples, the Jews to their synagogue, and the Romans paid homage to their Caesar, but a spiritual darkness shrouded the entire city. The city was rampant with pluralism and confusion. Sound familiar? It should. That's what's going on in America today. We got all this pluralism out there. There are a bunch of ways to God. And Christianity is under siege. Paul recognized and understood for the gospel to make inroads in Thessalonica, it first had to break through the fog of that city. It had to shine in the hearts of the Thessalonians themselves. Paul was convinced of this, that if he could successfully plant a church built on the Lord Jesus Christ in this strategically located city, this culturally diverse city, the gospel of Jesus Christ could then spread to Rome in the west and to Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey in the east. Paul and his missionary companions, Timothy and Silas, had personally themselves experienced the life-changing power of the gospel. Now these men are deeply, passionately committed to sharing the same good news with the people of Thessalonica. And we read about their ministry. Rick read about it for us in Acts 17, 1-9. First of all, we see that the gospel motivates in the first four verses. Many, many people, and I'm sure some here today, are extremely reluctant to take any kind of a risk. There are many who prefer to play life close to the vest. They say, I like the shore and the safe way. And many folks go out of their way to avoid taking risk. But if you're going to follow Jesus Christ, it's going to involve risk. Keep in mind, Christ is not looking for casual fans. He's looking for deeply devoted followers. 
And let me inform you that when you choose to become a follower of Jesus Christ, you do more than choose a different life. What happens in a very real sense is a different life chooses you. And this new life leads you to take bold and big steps. And I want to read a little bit about it in Luke chapter 9, because if you read the um, book Not a Fan, this verse should be familiar because it's the theme verse of Not a Fan, but a follower of Jesus. Here's what Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, if anyone wants to follow me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life, whoever surrenders his life to me, actually gains his life. Later in Luke's gospel, Jesus challenged his listeners to consider the cost of following him. Numerous times he said, if you will not do this, you cannot be my disciple. He never suggested that it would be easy to be his disciple. He made it clear he wasn't just trying to draw a large number of people to him. What he was looking for was men and women and young people totally sold out to him. Risk comes at a great cost. And quite honestly, not everyone's willing to pay that price. Denying ourselves, taking up the cross daily, and following a revolutionary figure like Jesus Christ, they are not natural pursuits for anyone. Such risk-taking requires a supernatural motivation. So what does a gospel motivate us to do? First of all, to go and to tell. This letter of 1 Thessalonians by, begins by introducing to us the founders of the church in Thessalonica, Paul and Silas and Timothy. And they were in the early weeks of their second missionary journey. Now know this. Their arrival in Thessalonica didn't happen by chance. It wasn't accidental. Through God's divine intervention, it was made clear that the gospel was go, to go to the region known as Macedonia. There are songs that talk about, we have heard the Macedonian call or the Macedonian vision. And that's referring to Acts 16 where Paul tried to go into another region and he said he was forbidden by the Holy Spirit to go into those regions. Even though that was Paul's agenda, it wasn't God's agenda. Instead, he had a vision, a dream where he saw a man from Macedonia calling out to him, come and help us, we need to hear the truth. Macedonia, that region, boasted some of the most culturally diverse and spiritually dark cities in the ancient world. What better place to preach the good news of Jesus Christ than to a dark place, spiritually speaking? Before they arrived in Thessalonica, Paul and his companions first ministered in the city of Philippi. You can read about that in Acts 16. There in Philippi, verse 14, they saw the first European convert come to Christ, a woman by the name of Lydia. And I want to point out to you, Acts 16, 14 says, the Lord opened her heart. Remember that. You have lost loved ones. We all do. If you don't have lost loved ones, come see me and I'll introduce you to some. But we all know them. We should be burdened for them. We should be praying for them. What should we be praying? That the Lord opens our heart. Because here's what happens. Sometimes we're so burdened for them, we try to go in and force them to come to Christ. And the Lord is not working in their heart at that given time, and we're making things worse. We're offending them. So we should be praying, Lord, I'm praying for my loved one. I want them to come to know Jesus. And I'm asking you to open their heart and your spirit to work in them. And if I go to them and I begin to talk to them and, they're, and you're not at work there, let me sense that and help me to have the wisdom to back off but to keep praying and look for another opportunity. Paul in Philippi was not embraced by everyone. Eventually, Paul found himself in prison along with his companion in missions, Silas. But that treatment of being in prison didn't stop Paul and his company. When they were released, they continued on to Thessalonica with renewed passion and an even greater sense of urgency. These missionaries, they rejoiced that even and especially in the midst of their personal troubles and the opposition that they faced, they rejoiced that God was up to something big. Countless lives were being radically changed. A vibrant church was planted, and the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, was advancing. 
We become passionate about the advancement of the gospel. If you're in Acts 17, look at the first two verses. Moving on from the trials in Philippi, Paul and his associates headed to Thessalonica with great expectation. And for these guys, ministry was not about their own comfort, their own good fortune, but solely about the advancement of the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, I think that Christianity in America today is markedly different. Some of us who name the name of Jesus Christ seem fixated on our own comfort, our own well-being. We bought into the consumer mindset so prevalent in our society. We somehow bought into the thinking, the wrong thinking, that God exists for us. We think that God is this genie in the sky, and we just rub God, and He gives us what we want. Or we think that God's a vending machine in the sky, and we just push a couple buttons, and He's supposed to spit out what we ask Him to do. Listen, read the Bible. God made us. We exist for Him. He is the Creator. We're the created being. The Bible makes it clear we are here for God. We think that we are somehow supposed to bask in sunshine all day long, every day. But that runs contradictory to the Scriptures. The Bible is filled with men and women that God used who went through great suffering to accomplish God's great work. Whether Paul experienced a revival or whether Paul found himself in the midst of a riot caused by his opponents, He remains steadfast in his commitment to carry out his God-given assignment to proclaim the good news to the Gentiles. Remember in Acts 9 when God called uh, Paul, it was Jesus that shone a light from heaven. He was blinded. And he said, I'm going to show him what great things he must suffer in order to be my servant to the Gentiles. And Paul suffered mightily, but he would not be deterred. Whether beaten and imprisoned as he was in Philippi, chased and pursued as he was in Thessalonica, or ridiculed and mocked in Athens, Paul made it clear he was not ashamed of the gospel. I love Romans 1.16. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God unto salvation to all that believe, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Paul was not ashamed. Why would you and I ever be ashamed of the gospel? Say, I don't want anybody to, though I'm a Christian, I don't want anybody to give me a hard time for my faith. We become passionate, second, about the proclamation of the gospel. We live in a society where everyone has their own opinion. And people are only too willing and eager to tell us what we should do or how we should live. Now, that's what's happening in our society. That's what's happening in our community. People are telling us how we should be living as Christians and how we should be tolerant Followers of Christ do not interpret the world through the lens of human or popular opinion. We as Christians interpret life through the lens of Scripture. The Bible is our supreme, our final authority. After they arrived in Thessalonica, as usual, the first place that Paul headed to was the synagogue because that place offered him a perfect scenario to preach the good news. And the Bible tells us that for three consecutive Sabbaths, Paul reasoned with them from the Scriptures. Biblical exposition is simply helping people to read the Bible for themselves. Keep in mind this. You say, what Scripture was he teaching them? Well, it had to only be the Old Testament because the New Testament had not yet been written. And he explained the the Old Testament prophecies, made it clear that the Christ, and if you have a footnote there, it says the Messiah must suffer and die and then rise from the grave. And Paul certainly could have been referring to passages like Isaiah 53, which presents Jesus as the suffering servant, the suffering Messiah. To remove any doubt, he stressed that the Jesus of Nazareth that he was proclaiming and promoting was indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Listen, as Christians, we must share the good news. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So as you prayerfully seek the Holy Spirit's help in sharing the gospel with others, remember two things that you should be sharing. You say, Pastor, what is it I should be sharing? First of all, you should be sharing the clear Word of God. Learn some verses that you can share with others. And again, I'll say to you, if you say, I don't know those verses, see me after. There's a great little booklet called Steps to Peace with God that has all kinds of verses to share with 
the people that you're targeting to bring to Jesus Christ. The second thing, in addition to the Scriptures, is to share your own personal testimony of how you came to Christ, what your life like, was like before Christ, how you put your faith in Christ, and how your life is different. Look at Acts 17.4, 17, and you see that the gospel hit home with more than a few people. And that's a fulfillment of Scripture because in Isaiah 55, 11, God said, My word will not return void. It will do what I intended to do. The good news of Christ had arrived in Thessalonica, and many received it with open hearts. But as was so often the case, this wonderful reception of the gospel was about to create some big problems for Paul and his associates. The gospel also, as you see in your outline, motivates us to press on to persevere, Acts 17, 5-9. Whenever the gospel is presented, you can anticipate one of three responses. When you share Jesus, you can expect one of these three things to happen. Some people will be angry. They will label you, label you a hate monger or a bigot. They'll ask you, who do you think that you are to insist that Jesus Christ is the only means to salvation? But listen to me. Don't apologize for that because that's not your idea. Jesus said it. I am the way, Jesus said, the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. You didn't make it up. That's what the Bible teaches. Others will, remove, will move from anger to outright persecution. And today, believers throughout the world are being subjected to unimaginable persecution. Many have suffered inhumane physical torture, and many have lost their lives for their faith and proclamation of Jesus Christ. And you and I are like, oh, somebody called me a Jesus freak. That's intense persecution. Somebody doesn't include me in their circle anymore. I'm being persecuted. I'm being abused. Tell that to the person in the Muslim countries. Tell that to the person in the Islamic countries. And they're going to go, really? You think that's tough? Come on over here and join us. Still others will embrace the gospel and come to Christ for salvation. Those are the very three responses in Thessalonica. The excitement and enthusiasm of the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks and the influ influential women coming to Christ for salvation was about to be threatened by an angry mob of unhappy Jews and evil men who had no time or tolerance for the gospel of Christ. And their displeasure rapidly erupted and led to intense persecution. And the gospel that Paul preached, know this, it's the only gospel. Paul says in Galatians 1.6, If any man preach any other gospel than I've already proclaimed to you, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, if anybody tries to preach something else, let him be accursed. Let him be anathema. The gospel, Acts 17.6, says, Turn the city upside down. That's what they really said in the King James Version. These men, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, have turned our society upside down. So what was it that Paul was charged with? Look at Acts 17, verse 7. These guys are stating there's another king other than Caesar. They're being disloyal to Rome. And they're telling us this other king, his name is Jesus. And these guys would have us to believe that the other gods that we've been worshiping are actually non-existent. They're telling us that this Jesus of Nazareth is the Savior of mankind, thus essentially teaching us that any other worship is futile. They're trying to persuade us that we must follow their God. They're threatening to unravel the core beliefs of many in our city. These guys have to be stopped, and they caused a riot. The message of Jesus was unacceptable to many in Thessalonica. It left a bad taste in their mouth. Here's an important truth I want to share with you. When Jesus Christ is effectively, faithfully proclaimed, you don't have to go around looking for courting persecution and opposition. It will come your way. 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul said, Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. What's it going to look like in America at this point? It may be you're in an office and they're going... We're not inviting him or her to go to lunch with us because you know what? They don't, let, they don't like us talking like that. They don't like us swearing. They don't like us using this language or telling that joke. I'm not. It hurts. You're left out. It may be your family going, wait a minute. 
you're telling us that our beliefs aren't right because you left us and you went to another church, so we don't want anything to do with you now, and your family cut you off. And that hurts. Listen to me. If you want to live a godly life, a life sold out to Jesus Christ, you will suffer persecution. Trust me, you don't have to go to somebody and say, hey, I haven't been persecuted for a while. Will you say something to me? Will you insult me? Will you leave me out of it? It happens. If it's not happening to you right now, thank God for the reprieve. Hey, I've said before, you want to kill a wedding reception? People's fun? Put the pastor at that table. And they're all like, I like when they go. They don't know who I am. I didn't do the wedding. They'll be like, uh, so what do you do for a living? I'm a pastor. <coughs> what, did I, what did I say so far? Um, how long is this guy going to stay here and make me miserable? And I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to stay here a long time. <laughs> because I get pleasure out. No, I don't get pleasure out of it. I do have to say, sometimes I get humbled too at wedding receptions because I did a wedding. Grandma was there and she didn't know I was the officiant at the wedding. So I made a big impact on her when her daughter said, this is the guy that did the wedding. She said, oh, you're the guy. Yeah, you just watched me for a half hour, but you didn't remember me. That's okay. But these young and tender believers in Thessalonica were rightfully and genuinely concerned for Paul and his companions. They urged Paul, Paul, you need to leave our midst for your own safety. And you need to do so under the cloak of darkness. And so Paul left almost immediately after this new church had been planted in Thessalonica. But as you look in 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 to 5, this church grew despite adversity. There's no doubt that Paul's decision he had to flee was an extremely painful one because a true shepherd is driven not by personal ambition, but a true shepherd is driven by a genuine love and concern for his flock. And adding to his own personal struggles, a pastor cares for the burdens of those under his ministry. Paul may have continued on in his journey to advance the gospel, but his heart was still very much engaged with the believers he left behind in Thessalonica. Now, I've had previously the privilege of pastoring at two other churches. And I did that for a number of years, over 10 years at both. And I can tell you that I left behind some very dear friends and my heart's still greatly concerned for each of those bodies, and I pray daily for their continued growth. I love and care about the well-being of those that I shepherded. Paul may have successfully escaped the physical threat to his own life, but he just couldn't emotionally and spiritually disengage from those that he'd led to Christ. He wondered, do those people feel, feel like I left them and I abandoned them, I gave up on them? to fend for themselves, he wondered, was the persecution that I fled from too great for them? Were they still walking with Christ? And so he writes this letter to 1 Thessalonians, and verses 1 to 5 of chapter 3 give us some insight into Paul's heart. He wanted the people there to be assured of his love for them. He wanted to know how they were doing. Timothy had visited Thessalonica and came back with a report for Paul, and Paul had great joy. The church in Thessalonica, if you look at 1 Thessalonians 3, 6, 8, kept growing through adversity. The church was still alive and well. Instead of snuffing out the light, the persecution served to fan the flame of growth. That's exactly what happened to Christianity in Acts 8. It says that they were persecuted, and the believers scattered, and wherever they went, they proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ. This local church at Thessalonica was growing in its faith in Christ and its love for Paul, who led them to Jesus. The gospel transforms. It transforms people. The Greek word for church in 1 Thessalonians 1.1 1, 1 is ecclesia, which literally means a called out ones. The church consists of people that God has called out from the world. Paul's preaching had an undeniably pro profound effect on those who believed in Jesus Christ. Now, know this. Keep this in mind. If you pick something up, it most often requires that you put something down. 1 Thessalonians 1.8 is what I'm talking about in 9. Paul said, the people around you are talking about you in Thessalonica. They know how you turned to God from idols. You have a changed life. When these believers at Thessalonica turned to God, they subsequently turned from something, idol worship. 
And their new life in Christ caused them to leave their old life. When a person, if you see your outline, when a person comes to know Jesus, they will know change. And if there's no change, there's likely no Jesus. That's the powerful admonition that Paul gives to us in 2 Thessalonians 13.5. This applies to every one of us. Here's what he said. Test or examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. In other words, look carefully into your own life. What evidence is there in your life that you truly are a follower of Jesus Christ? These Thessalonians were markedly, visibly different. They abandoned the legalism of Judaism, the emptiness of their idol worship, and the bankruptcy of religious ritual to serve the living, true God. Their lives were radically altered. They were called out of darkness into light. When the gospel penetrates hearts, it changes people. The gospel also transforms position. There's the old American Express Company. They used to tell its customers, membership has its privileges. The privileges of a credit card company may offer short-term benefits. But let me assure you that those short-term benefits pale in comparison to the lasting riches guaranteed to those who are in Christ Jesus. If you are a member of God's church, you are a recipient benefit, a beneficiary of His peace and His grace. Now, we sang about amazing grace today. Grace has to do with our standing before God. Because prior to Christ, we are sinners by birth and by nature. By one man, sin entered the world and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are blinded by our sin. We're incapable of having a relationship with the Holy God. In fact, Paul said we're dead in our sin and trespasses. We're in this spiritual fog headed down a path that leads to destruction. But the good news is God has done something about that moral and spiritual fog. He's offered us a way out. That way out is Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. God made the one, His Son, Jesus, who never sinned, to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Jesus took all your sins and all my sins on His body as He hung on the cross. He died once to bring us to God. God's forgiveness can't be earned. It is a gift. That's why it's grace. We must receive that gift. For by grace are you saved through faith, and this is not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are saved by God's amazing grace through faith in Christ Jesus. There's no other way. So how'd you sing that song today? This is amazing grace. Think God got excited about that? How'd you sing it? It should blow you away. Wow, I am saved from my sin and its penalty by God's amazing grace. The incredible good news is the moment we put our faith in Jesus as our Savior, our standing before God changes forever. We become members of God's family. As many as received Him, to them God gave the right to become children of God. Our citizenship is transferred from earth to heaven. Paul said our citizenship is in heaven. Through Christ, we now have a proper relationship with God, and it's all because of grace. Just remember this. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. We don't deserve forgiveness of sin, but we get it through Jesus Christ. Peace the second part of Paul's greeting in 1 Thessalonians 1.1 1, 1, has to do with our relationship with God because according to Romans chapter 5, verse 10, prior to Christ, we were enemies of God because of our sin. We were cut off from God, alienated from God because of our sin. We had no peace. The United States has many enemies, and people are desperately searching, uh, searching for peace. The sad reality is, People today are looking for peace in all the wrong ways. And all we got is people running around our country. They're angry. They're disillusioned. They're disappointed. They're afraid. They're disgruntled. They don't have the abundant life that Jesus said, I came to give. He said in John 10, 10, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly to the fullest. The good news is you can have peace with God through placing your faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 1 says we have peace with God. Through Jesus Christ. Romans 8 1 says there's no, 
now no more condemnation to those that are in Christ. God wants you to experience peace on a daily basis. The Thessalonians could have peace even though they were experiencing extreme persecution. How could they have peace? Because the God to whom they belong to never slumbers or sleeps. People tell me sometimes, Pastor, the hardest part of the day for me is the wee hours of the morning when I wake up and I start thinking about stuff and there's no one to talk to and I'm alone and I'm hurting. Listen, you can talk to God any time of the day. He never slumbers. He never sleeps. He said, I'll never leave you. Psalm 46.1 says he's an ever-present help in time of trouble. I like the saying, no God, K-N-O-W God, K-N-O-W peace. It also says, no God, N-O God, no peace. Paul's time in Thessalonica was short, about three weeks. If we didn't have the rest of the story, we might think, well, his mission was a failure. He left after three weeks. But as we have discovered, the faith of these genuine believers was anything but shallow or superficial. They had a love for Christ, a burning desire to proclaim His life-changing gospel message. Even in the midst of troubling circumstances, God was doing work His way. And if if God can use angry mobs and frustrated plans to bring about one of the most encouraging letters in the New Testament, rest assured that God can use your life experiences to bring about your ultimate good and His greater glory. While on this side of heaven, you and I are afforded only an occasional glimpse of what God's doing in the world, know this, that God is up to way more than you can imagine. You don't, you're not privy to everything that God is doing. There are believers all over the world living vibrant lives for Jesus Christ. These first century believers have long since been transported to heaven. But the faith of the Thessalonians continues to inspire and encourage those who followed after them. You and I stand on their shoulders. Know this, that those who come behind us stand on our shoulders. That's why I say it's time for Christians in America to take a stand, to not back down. I'm not saying be belligerent, be obnoxious, go out and burn cars, go out and smash windows. I'm saying love people with the genuine love of Jesus Christ. Stand up and if people get on you because you're a Christian, that's such a small price to pay for what Jesus did for us. My prayer is you moms and dads, your children who are looking to you, will see a mom and dad who love Jesus Christ. They'll see grandparents who love Jesus Christ. If you're just an older adult and you don't have kids or grandchildren, I pray that they look at you and say, there's a, there's a person who loves Jesus. That's what a Christian's supposed to be like. That's how they're supposed to love. That's how they're supposed to live. I want to be like that. Test yourself to see if you're in the faith. Let's pray. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I want to ask you, Is God your Father? Jesus said, this is eternal life that they know you, the one true God and your Son whom you have sent. Can you say, I know Jesus personally as my Savior? If you can, thank God for that. Maybe you're here and you say, I'm not sure, Pastor. I'm I'm pretty sure I don't know Jesus, but I want to be sure. Then I encourage you to pray a prayer similar to this in the quietness of your heart. And Jesus said, the one that comes to me, I'll never turn away. Pray a prayer similar to this. Dear Lord Jesus, Lord, I admit, I agree, I am a sinner. And I understand that you went to the cross. That crimson blood that we sang about can cleanse my sin. You took my sins on your body. You shed your blood. I'm sorry, Lord, for my sin. I'm asking you to forgive me, to cleanse me. Jesus, I'm opening my life to you, man, inviting you in to be my Savior. And I want to follow you from this moment on. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you prayed that prayer this morning, just ask you to slip your hand up. Yes, are there any others? Say, I prayed, Pastor. Today I asked Jesus. Any others? Perhaps there are those that say, I, I'm willing to examine my life. I want to really go home and look and see. How is my life different? Because Jesus Christ is my Savior. I'm going to spend some time this week thinking about that question. Would you pray for me, Pastor? Is any like that? Many hands. Father, you've put us here in this community to be a lighthouse for you, to stand up for you unashamedly. Lord, sometimes we'll go through persecution and hard times. Help us not to give up. Help us to be willing to take a risk to follow you, to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow you. Lord, I pray that in and through our lives that Jesus Christ would be lifted up. It's in his name we pray. Amen.